we open the floor to questions, and um, I ask that you identify who you are and that you ask a question. Um, uh, I may interrupt you if you give too much commentary. So I believe the gentleman on the left was first, followed by Dr. Roman. So I was curious that in your presentation, you didn't mention, I'll say, the historical religious conflict between Poland and the Ukraine. So that the most revered object in Catholic Poland is the Black Madonna of Czestochowa, which, according to uh, uh, an exhibit, was looted from a Ukrainian church and is actually a, a you know, an Orthodox icon. And as part of that exhibit, apparently there were other icons that were looted by the Poles. So I was curious why this history didn't come up in you know the 20s and 30s as a justification of reprisals or revenge or whatever? Well, it did. It, uh, the Oun in the 1920s, it was actually formed in 29, but already in the 20s and the 30s, uh, there was uh, a lot of discussion about uh, Polish injustices committed uh, against the Ukrainian population. And there, there was a lot of talk about, about these things. And the fact that Ukrainian churches were being forcibly transferred to Roman Catholicism, uh, particularly in the Holm, Helm or Holmstina area, where there were something like 138, I believe, churches who were, who were, who were forcibly uh, made Roman Catholic, that became a big, big issue. Um, Poland became increasingly nationalistic after about the mid-30s, and um, there was a policy to, to Polonize. Um, and and the, the, the struggle against the Ukrainian church was part of that. So it did come up, and it was, uh, it was fuel for the recruitment of radicals, uh, what the Aun, the re reason why Aun kept picking up was because people said the Democrats are useless. They're not defending us. They can't win. All they're interested in is having their 24 members of parliament. There'd been a deal where Ukrainians got a certain representation. And this anger. I'm sure you're familiar with it today in politics. This anger uh, tended to fuel uh, recruitment to the OWN. Yes, yes. <coughs> All the harmonization. Um, <coughs> yeah. Is there an attempt, or would it, would it be useful to uh, make a comparison between the uh, Ukrainian revolutionary movement and the liberation movement with others? Uh, Polish uh, revolutionary movement in Armia Krajowa and the uh, Polish uh, underground, uh, the uh, Jewish Irgun, uh, for instance, or the Irish, even the, uh, the Cuban uh, revolution, in order to, uh, to see uh, what are the differences and what are the similarities. This is a topic that uh, yeah. conceptually, you know, I find it. Uh, that's uh, very interesting. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, uh, something that you should... I'm not a political scientist, per se, anyway. I, I dabble a little bit. But that's a, a good topic for political scientists. I believe that uh, Alexander Motel has spoken about this. Uh, there is a, a scholar, uh, one of the best uh, Ukrainian historians of the far right, the own and similar groups, is Alexander Zaitsev, and he has made similar comparisons. Um, uh, the, the, these, these movements, yeah, they, they, they're, cl they're similar but different, and there's certainly uh, a lot that can be gotten from them. We tend to think of the far right as one thing or, you know, there's a, actually quite a large spectrum there from conservative, 
uh, radical conservative to, you know, neo-Nazi. Uh, but there's a whole spectrum in between. There's, there's a lot of <coughs> possibilities. And, and it probably would be good, if only because the own and the radical right in Ukraine went through an evolution. And we need better tools to see how that evolution occurred. Yes, thank you. I, I hope I won't be cut off by not asking a question <laughs> right up front, but I did want to say uh, that uh, I was listening to you with fascination, as if there's no one else in the room. Uh, I really loved the manner of your nuanced explanation, very careful, based on having read texts, which you're right, most people don't do, alas. Um, and in the end, it seemed to me that your whole story boiled down to the, to the your conclusion, as sometimes it would, uh, because it wasn't clear where you were coming out on many things. Uh, it could, it, your comments could be read one way, quite negative, but that last comment at the end, where you have now provided us or the audience, not only here in general, with uh, a framework, and that the framework, at least from your point of view, is 4546. That it's in 4546 that you are willing and able to look at these figures uh, who are participating in uh, in the UPA right. uh, as as true heroes. Um, this is what I got, and th th this one doesn't usually hear this. Now we can talk about them as true heroes. But the implication of that could be, well, does that mean that all of the activists in OUN and UPA, whether they or M, were not heroes? All of them were not heroes? Some of them were not heroes? Some of them were fighting for a cause? Not? I mean, is, is, this, a, is, is this a hard division uh, and also in terms, the last, my last question and comment here, in terms of the way you were describing certain issues, so for instance you talked about Vyatrovich, and here is a figure who's of very importance at the, at the moment, he's come out with this book, you listed various aspects of the book, followed by, well, there are a lot of problems with the book and there's a lot of criticism. <coughs> well, is there also not a lot of positive things about yeah. it? You mentioned one little one, but it, you're, it was the focus on the criticism. And then similarly, when you talked about the Wehrmacht, the Wehrmacht exhibition. Well, we had this Wehrmacht exhibition, and there's a lot of criticism of it. Well, yes, that's okay, but what about the positive elements of this? So, this is what I mean by, I'm wondering if your great ability at presenting things in a nuanced fashion slips sometimes. <laughs> well, okay, let, let, me, let me make th three, three points um, um, that, um, that mind you, I, I agree that, uh, that in a short presentation one sometimes tries to do a lot, um, uh, but there are many nuances, many more nuances. Okay, so one of the things that I, uh, in very crude terms, I have looked at three types, three categories of nationalism. The National Democrats, the own, the Dontsovists. Don't, don't but you know, there are slippages between these. And the reason why the three categories are interesting and important is because that allows you to understand how someone could be part of one, move to the second, go to the third, move back to the second, and end up back in the first. This is how things worked. We know that uh, Milena Rudnitska, the great uh, uh, orator, uh, a woman uh, in the Polish same who defended Ukrainian interests, had very good relations with Konovalitz. Uh, and when she traveled to uh, the West, 
uh, the Oon around Konovalich supported her struggle to publicize the famine, publicize uh, pacificatia, the pacification, and Onatsky arranged an interview with Mussolini for her to get publicity going. You know, the Kedrin, who was uh, uh, more of a national democrat, never a member of Oun, had very good relations with uh, the leadership of the Oun. These connections existed, and Konovalis was a smart man. He knew that the national liberation struggle, as he put it, was not just about violence. It was not just about a violent paramilitary group. It was going to be a national operation. So let's not romanticize terrorism. That's only one tactic. We have to win the big struggle as well. So it's a far more complicated business. And this slippage between the different kinds of uh, nationalism was a, a common thing at the time. Heroes. I often get asked about this. Some poor, <coughs> some person, the last time I gave a similar talk, threw up their arms and said, we don't have any heroes. Who are the heroes? Who's left? That's kind of hard to answer, but uh, well, the first thing I said was, you know what Tolstoy said? He said, uh, my hero is the truth. So. Let's start at getting at the truth, figure out that. Um, and why do you think that people have to be crystal clear? Why do they have to be super clean all the time? Humanity is uh, what Isaiah Berlin said, crooked timber. We make life, we make society out of crooked timber. That's what human beings are. So yeah, they can be heroes at some point, they can be villains at another point, why not accept that people can, all, can be both victims and at different times perpetrators? Why don't we have a more complicated, a mature view, a more mature view of history? Um, and the last uh, uh, interesting, th oh yeah, the third thing that you said, Piotrovich. Yeah, I only focused on the negatives because I only, I, it's a critique of Vyatrovich's uh, presentation. There are many things in Vyatrovich's book that are very good. Um, he challenges the Polish view, which, is, uh, which he does well. He challenges the, um, the uh, uh, prejudices uh, that the, some of the Polish, uh, not the intelligent Polish community, not the scholars, but some of the more journalistic individuals have uh, towards uh, the Ukrainian situation. He um, is able to draw on many new sources who in the past has actually taken seriously, for example, the interrogation of, U of UPA prisoners and the files of those interrogations that are in the secret police archives. Mostly Ukrainian, until now, most Ukrainians have dismissed them. They must, be, they must be tainted. But if you read them carefully, if you read them through a filter, you can get much from them. And Vitrovich does that. Those are very important um, aspects of his book that I think are, are, are positives. Uh, so I, 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 you know, I'm trying to tread fairly carefully, uh, not be entirely dismissive, and certainly not be. Um, entirely laudatory in my attitude towards him. Dr. Sisson. Hi, Mishra. So, uh, as you point out these differences, I thought of your fellow Winnipegger, Zarya Hume's review of Sarita Mar's book, uh, which I think does a brilliant job of showing that the collapsing of all Ukrainian tendencies into one, and above all about Milena Rubinska, but about others, right. should not be done. On the other hand, uh, there is a certain danger in the scheme, I think, that you've created, and I think what has to be carefully differentiated is who, who, whose nationalism is this about? Uh, You're talking about the three nationalisms? The three nationalisms yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know from the interview of the projects I do with rural populations, very frequently the national liberationists are both the communists and the ON people, and many of the former communists joined the ON. So all left, right, Oh, yeah. ideology that's written in the view when it got down to a village level was something really very different. What they were interested in was was revolutionary, goes back to the and, right. and left and right made little difference. So I wonder 
Well, on the one hand, how do you deal with that? That is, did you, uh, and I assume in the book I'll find out how carefully it's defined as whose nationalism is this, and am I really talking about intellectuals, or am I talking about reception of their ideas, or am I talking about uh, what broader groups of the population? So that's question one. Two is models when you compare the people of the 30s and now. Now, uh, regrettably, I missed the beginning of your lecture, and I, I apologize if I say it again, but of course, they had very clear models of people who lived in a legitimate world under Austria-Hungary, who decided to fight for Ukraine, and who was the older generation whom they looked up to. But people today do not have this. That is, they, only, they look back, where is this group they're going to right. find within their lifetime and time? And does that change it? And then the third is this issue of collaborationism. Uh, I, how well do you think, I try and argue, and usually unsuccessfully, that the first great collaborationism occurred in 1923 when people had to take the oath to the Polish state. That almost all Ukrainians were collaborators who had jobs, who could exist. They'd already begun a process in which they had to collaborate, and this certain group could reject it or not reject it. Oh, and, then, and then just the only final comment on the National Democratic Camp, where are you going to put the Radikalna Partia, which still existed? I think this National Democrats is, would seem to come from the UNDO and from the from the, uh, from the uh, pre-war uh, national democracy. Regrettably, Poles don't understand this because they associate it with their national democracy. But you've still got other groups who are still rejections that where I can put the time. Yes, well, you know, uh, these are crude categories, and uh, they uh, are stimulation for, for other people to come along and refine and rethink these things. But I wrote it in that way because I, first of all, I want to drive a wedge between the Donsov, fanatical, fanatical Donsovian nationalists and the Oun. I think the Oun is a much more uh, complicated business. Uh, and I'm really concerned that there are people in Ukraine today who don't make any distinctions between the, these two these two things. So I, I was, this is my crude way of saying, think about these fundamental differences. Um, I agree that there are many subcategories within each, within the, the national, or one type of authoritarian nationalism and within national democratic camp, that's a, the national democratic camp is a catch-all. It's just a huge catch-all. All sorts of th things happen there. All sorts of people are placed in there. And we need far more subtle tools for looking at it. But what disturbs me when I look at this kind of uh, rewriting of history is that the, it, it's almost as like as though the majority were our own supporters, and we have a few National Democrats, or all the rest, and the, their own supporters are pro Dontov. This needs to be reframed, rethought. So that, that's basically, a, it's just a very, it's a polemical argument, if you want to put it that way. Um, I, try, I try and be a little more careful in my book, of course, um, but, uh, but I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not setting this up as a, a rigid uh, c a set of categories. Collaborators, well, yeah, you know, Peter Potichny used to begin his talks by saying, Ukrainians collaborated with everybody. Um, I don't know if you could make the case that, uh, that uh, collaboration with the Polish regime was collaboration. I'm sure a lot of people would say that uh, they didn't really have, that they didn't consider themselves collaborators. That get what you can, struggle within the system. If it gives you the possibility to, to have elections and so on, go ahead. But you had to take the oath. Right? There was an actual act by which you, if you wanted to keep your job, you had to take the oath to the Polish state. And that, that was it. Well, uh, but, but, yeah, yeah. You, know, you could argue it wasn't collaboration, yeah. but, 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 you, but, you, but it, by the way the state framed it. Yeah. But you could also say that uh, the transitional demand is autonomy within Galicia. Yeah, yeah. and that's, you know, for most people that would be where, where they, they, they parked their politics. Yeah, we want push, to push Ukrainian rights to the point where we can get autonomy. 
Uh, what was your second, the middle point? Well, uh, how much intellectual, how much you're trying to, the perception, how much you're trying to discuss why, because when you move to the heroes of those, oh, those guys joining uh, in 44, 45, we've moved to sort of mass participation of people who are not terribly ideological necessarily. Yeah. That's, a very, that's a hard question. That's, uh, uh, I, go back to my, I go back to my image of young, just imagine, 17 year old, he just wants to fight back. He just wants to hit back. He hasn't read the literature, he's not going to read the literature, he just give me a gun, allow me to fight. And for many people it was, if, I, I mean if, if you look at their, what drove them, it would not particularly be uh, a, a worked out ideology. Uh, people joined the communist movement as well without having read Lenin or Marx. They probably they read Marx. They probably become anti-communist, but by the time they got through it, it was so confusing. But you know, people don't join these movements for those reasons. Um, it's uh, it, it's a it's at a different level, um, and uh, I, I I would. Uh, I would ask you perhaps to read some of the later pamphlets by people like Petro Poltava or um, Hornovei. They're very, they're, they're much more uh, geared towards uh, uh, international national, national liberation struggle, the same as it is everywhere else in the world. It's freedom for individuals, freedom for people. This is what is now being picked up on uh, in, uh, in contemporary Ukraine. What went on in the heads of those people, I'm not sure. Before I have collected three more questions, may I, may your book be passed around? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about Don So um, as a myth maker. And um, if, I, I'd like to ask you to look at it from this particular <laughs> perspective. Um, Two of your bullet points jumped out at me uh, with respect to Don So. First is uh, overstepping moral boundaries. Um, Kierkegaard wrote about that in Fear and Loathing. You know, why did Abraham, why was Abraham willing to kill his son Isaac? You know, and, and his yeah. explanation is that he had, he was living, you know, under a religious, in the religious sphere rather than in the ethical moral sphere. So yeah. God told him, kill your son. And he was doing that because that was more important than any moral code. That's Kierkegaard. Another thing with respect to Don So, he used pseudonyms, you said. Yeah. Well, so did Kierkegaard. He, he never, basically never wrote under his own name. Um, the other bullet point that jumped out at me is uh, that you wrote that uh, Don So was in favor of a psychological spiritual revolution. And, and this, is, this is purely Nietzsche. I mean, Nietzsche's, Nietzsche is... Right is misunderstood as talking about politics, like will to power, etc., when in fact he's talking about psychology. Like in, that, in that respect, if you're going to make cartoons of Tarashevchenko, I prefer to see him as Batman rather than Superman, because Batman you know, only uses human powers. Right. Right? And, and uh, so, um, Anyway, as, as a myth maker, you know, perhaps he himself is mis was he influenced by these uh, writers? And, and, you know, was he mis... Nietzsche, for sure. Yeah, yeah Nietzsche, yeah. For sure. But he was misinterpreting it, by my way. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's, my, I, that's what I'd like to ask you to, to comment on. Well, it? very briefly, I'll just say that, yeah, there is a religious, a kind of religious foundation, religious inspiration, good versus evil, but it's all twisted. It is, you know, how we define good is uh, different from the Christian way of defi defining good. Um, and uh, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's this sort of a sense of realpolitik, the rea real world that we live in is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. We have to recognize that. We have to understand that. We have to be stronger than the other people. We have to have teeth and claws. That's the only way we will survive. We need strength, you know. So, um, Donsov is clearly uh, egging people on. You know, for Donsov, the Aun was not radical enough. It just wasn't radical enough. It was, they argued too much. They talked too much. And, you know, they should be more like the Nazis. Huh. Power, strength. 
so uh, how do we get to that point? We have to inf- running away to Berlin when they're going get stuff, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we have to inflame people. Well, there were many people in the own who went along with that, who agreed with that. Um, but then when the realities uh, set in, they often turned around, went the other way. I have to permit myself the pleasure of making a comment before I pose the, the question. <clears throat> My comment is about your hero, Truth. I'd like to quote Pontius Pilate, <laughs> what is truth? <laughs> I mean, all of this stuff uh, seems to revolve about not stated what you've written, but there's some ultimate truth and uh, most of the other stuff is either propaganda or some extreme deviation of some sort. I find that bothersome, but let me pose the question. It's about the ideologues, okay? Let's put unsolved aside, but all the other ones, many of whom I've read, not all of them. Uh, It seems to me that they have very little influence on the leadership of the own past the Konovalis generation. Uh, I wonder, were they at all read by the even officers of the UPA to say nothing of their rank and file? Uh, that's a question, and, but I, I'll, I'd like to make one other point because I'll forget about it, it won't be raised. I grew up, uh, I was a kid when uh, the older ones were taking part in all of this. And most people, especially in Galicia, never bothered asking the question about what kind of a a country we're building. The only question was, we want independence. Once we settle that, then we'll figure out the country. And that is almost never pointed out. Uh, it's, I don't think that the ideology, A, was very influential, and B, was necessary. Hmm. Okay, on truth. <laughs> uh, I find it much more disturbing when people say, forget about truth. Can't be any truth. You know. Uh, I find that much more much more difficult to to stomach. There's no unique, absolute. Ah absolute well, absolute. now now you're starting to hedge. <laughs> no, 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 no. I quoted. I quoted. <laughs> I I think the way you 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 get to understand things is through through open, honest uh, argument, and people adjust their positions. You say one thing, somebody comes along says, well, you missed this, you didn't see this, I would disagree with this. You adjust your position, you know, and we, we get closer to the facts. There are things like archives, there are things like history books, there are things like uh, oral interviews. All these things can feed into a better understanding of what's going on. There's no absolute, of course, you know, we're, every generation sees the world differently and will reinterpret. Yeah, that's true. That's why we, cultural memory history is, uh, cultural memory studies is so interesting, so important. But, uh, but I, I don't. I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm not a nihilist or a deconstructionist uh, uh, who who uh, who argues that it's simply not not possible in principle. Therefore, anything is possible. Uh, that's Vladimir Surkov, and that's those are the, the that's the Russian uh, ideologies today. The cynical ideology of the Russian uh, uh, leadership there. Um, yeah, I think that uh, you're probably correct that uh, the nationalists in emigration tended to read their literature. Much of it could not be smuggled into Galicia. Much of it wouldn't have been read anyway by some of the young people in Galicia who uh, were more interested in you know, fighting rather than studying. And how, how would they have gotten this literature into the bunkers and various other places that just, it wouldn't have penetrated many places. So um, 
uh, we get back to the question that Frank raised, you know, what actually was going on in the minds of many of these uh, young people. We're not sure whether they were strongly influenced. In any case, the ideology had changed by that time. But I would say even reading carefully those ideologists gives you a much more interesting picture, a much more complicated picture than many people uh, think um, it, it, it was. I mean, it's worth reading for those reasons. What was your third point, your last point? Oh, it was about uh, the influence of the ideology on the leadership beyond Novalis. Yeah. That's the one point. And yeah. the other is that the disregard of ideology by the common people. Right. The ideology was we want yeah, I, I think that uh, that became the Every other state. that became the basic position, the ground zero. But uh, there is evidence. We do have uh, information about uh, the conferences that were held in the 30s, where the leadership of the younger generation in Galicia went to conferences in Prague and uh, I think in Berlin, places like that, and did listen to these. Co these uh, papers that were presented. So, uh, Konovalis would, uh, would tell them, uh, you tend to romanticize terrorism. It's only a tactic. It's not, it's, it's, it's not everything. Be careful. There were presentations given of uh, Vladimir Martinez, who wrote a, a very funny essay about uh, why uh, Ukrainians should eat more meat, strengthen their spirit, uh, this was a, uh, a takeoff on Marinetti's famous uh, article in his uh, Italian ki uh, Futurist Kitchen, in which he said uh, Italians uh, should stop eating pasta. It makes them soft. Uh, they should eat more meat. It's done tongue in cheek, right? So Martinez does a similar thing. Says, well, Ukraine was great in the Cossack era. Look at how much meat they ate, how, many, how much fish protein they ate. Um, we need to develop this, and the, 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 the weakest part of the Ukrainian nation is all those people in the Transcarpathia who eat Mama Liga. Look what it, <laughs> look what it does to their brains, right? <coughs> well, Bandera and the other people got up and said, why do we have to listen to this nonsense? What are you doing here? And Konovalich said, you know, not everything that is said or written stands the test of time or should be taken too seriously. I mean, he, he, has, a, he has a good sense of humor, dry sense of humor, kind of always. And basically, he said, uh, you know, loosen up, be a little more, uh, uh, try and think a little bit, a bit outside the box a bit. That was his, was his way of putting it. Uh, they, I think it was an attempt to influence that younger generation. But these were people who were educated on struggle. Uh, they'd been imprisoned. They, uh, they were constantly about to be arrested or had just been arrested, been on trial. It was, a, it was a different world. So when they came out and saw uh, the older generation in Prague cafes, you know, stirring their coffee and, you know, they really didn't like this. There was a generational difference. Um, and eventually that exploded uh, into a, a separation. Um, so I want to um, thank you very much for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I think what you're doing is really important in terms of disaggregating <coughs> the kinds of stereotype, the stereotypical views of Ukrainian nationalism that, um, that exist in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine. Um, and I wanted to <clears throat> ask you about, um, in, in your work and in your presentation, uh, I think that one, I would like to know how you treat the issue of uh, the Soviet legacy and, how, and the Soviet legacy of representations of old. Because um, my, uh, my sense of it is that if, if you were to give Petrovich and company a kind of generous reading of what their work is meant to do, it's also meant to not just construct a, a myth, mythological sort of hero cult about Bandera or Umbe, but right. it's also to deconstruct Soviet mythologies 
And so they're, they're actually work, not just working, looking back directly to history, but they're working through these layers of, of historical representations that have been building up over decades since, <coughs> since World War II. So that's, that's one point. Um, and it may also go some way towards explaining uh, why there is this obsession with own bet, which I think is a totally valid critique of, of a lot of the, the actors. Because this was the thing that the Soviet ideological and propaganda apparatus was obsessed with. Right, because they they wanted to reduce the whole spectrum of Ukrainian right wing or, or Ukrainian nationalism to this one party that they they could then right. uselessly you know beat people over the head with that these are like the evil opponents of Soviet power. So how do how do you deal with the, the Soviet legacy, which is kind of an elephant in the field, so to speak? No, you're absolutely right. I agree. Uh, uh, that is one of the main reasons why people are fascinated by the Banderites, and that's why the Jewish community, uh, the Jewish activists on the Maidan produced t-shirts saying Zhido uh, Banderovitz or Zhido Banderivitz, I'm a Jew Banderite. I mean, what they're, well, they're throwing back the insult. You call us Banderites because we're for an independent Ukraine? Okay, we're Banderites. We're for an independent Ukraine. If that's what it means, fine. That's, that's, uh, that's why it, it, is, it is trendy in some ways to, to call yourself a, a Banderite, but you're changing the term, the meaning of the term. You're not looking at what, the, what, the, what Owen Bear really was in the 30s or the 40s. You're not, you're not analyzing it. But I think, yeah, you're right, and that's where Vyatrovich begins, and that's where the fascination, the romanticization comes in. And I have to say, I think that Petrovich is moving to a more, uh, to a different kind of um, assessment. If you read his book, it's more nuanced than the previous one, and it's moving in the direction of uh, um, admitting certain issues, admitting certain problems, admitting, admitting certain excesses, um, so, you know, this is why I think you can get, you can approach the truth. <laughs> you can gradually, you know, as, as people sit down and talk and, and, and sift evidence, you can get closer. And I think, yeah, uh, there, there will be a time when, when we will uh, 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 construct a narrative which is all-encompassing, which is embracing of, uh, uh, of, uh, of many strands and, and, uh, and satisfies more and more people. Yes, uh, Don Chmielski. Um I spent a lot of time over the last couple of years over in Ukraine, and uh, I agree with your straw man analogy, but at the same time, I think the straw man, before it left the Kremlin, sort of ignited on them and backfired on them. Mm. So it caused the, the country to, to unite behind it. Uh, sort of the Zhidobandarivich example that you're mentioning. It's, uh, and I think Oun over the years has undergone uh, more of a, from a revolutionary struggle, sort of like anything from the IRA to the Cubans to whoever, to more of a, in my mind, from what I've read, and even the way Stitsko has changed the stance over the years, and then his wife, and so on, this whole cave versus Moscow thing uh, has, has basically caused the country. Like when I saw the the Ukrainian battalions there, even the Russian-speaking ones, a lot of them are, have like red and black on them. They don't, all they know is it means opposition to Moscow. Right. 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 So, if I could get your comment on that. No, I, I agree. Uh, red and black flags. Uh, Heroyam Slava, all these elements that uh, they're a legacy. They've been reinterpreted. They've been brought in. But I mean, I grew up in the '60s. Everybody had Che Guevara T-shirts. What did they know about Che Guevara, right? Or Mao T-shirts, right? I mean, this is—it's a symbolic thing. It's a symbol of we are—we are protesters. We are against the system. You know, it, it, it has different meanings. There, there's one thing I, I want to also point out that I found very interesting. I, I go on Google search and I just type in Oun on a Google search. All the, all the material coming out of Moscow and the Kremlin right now, 
It's not about any other faction. There's mounts and mounts of material just about the Bandarius. Right. Right? The, you, you won't see yeah. own and mentioned anywhere. Right? Yeah. No, and it, it is. It, attack yeah, it, and it is prepared. You're absolutely right. It's uh, there. Are, there are people who work to uh, to uh, prepare this concept. There are also some funny things going on in those websites that you mentioned. I got interested in. I haven't spoken much about the writers, but they are interesting writers. That I I hope if you can read my book, you will get interested in some of them. One of them is uh, Yuri Lipa. Very interesting writer, uh, very interesting man, and eventually he was he was killed. Uh, he was, became a doctor for the UPA, and he was killed. Um, but uh, he wrote a great deal. He was almost like the a challenger to uh, to Donsov as for ideological leadership of the nationalists. And he wrote a lot as a doctor, uh, even about uh, genetics, about uh, the difference between Russians and Ukrainians, uh, a lot about cultural differences. No. But what I noticed on the websites was that these, mm, you know, Patriot Ukraine or these Bandarivets websites would reprint certain passages, certain sections of his book in order to show that he was a racist. And they think this is a good thing, right? Ukrainian blood is different from Russian blood, it's a good thing. But if you have read carefully uh, Yuri Lipa, you know that he said exactly the opposite. So did uh, Martinez, so did uh, uh, the, all these ideologists. It's not about genetics, it's not about biology, it's not about blood. It's about commitment to a political cause. That's what, what uh, nationalism is. And the next section um, negates or explains the previous section. So there's somebody is manufacturing a certain image and quoting in a in a very selective way in order to present a view. Uh, and I think that's deliberate and it's probably not done by uh, by people who are uh, sort of within within the, the party or within the framework of the party. It's probably being fed them. From, from somewhere else. We had um, a follow-up question from Dr. Romanish and then Mrs. Romanish. Uh, in your you know, presentation, you mentioned an interesting detail that Yevhen uh, Natsky uh, organized a meeting for Yevhen Lubnitsky with Mussolini. <coughs> you know, um, at least from my experience, from, from what I read and so on, uh, that particular event uh, some historians and political scientists today would interpret, aha, uh -huh, Milena Rudinsky met with Mussolini, therefore she is a right. fascist. Right. And, uh, and no, so, no. so this yeah. is, uh, you know, um, uh, 20, hindsight 2020 hindsight. Now, <clears throat> um, that's not why she met him. <laughs> that's not why she met him. She met him because she wanted to arrange uh, for students from Lviv to be able to study in Italy. Well, what I'm trying to say is that uh, these events and uh, should be uh, by historians and political science should be put in context. Right. At the time, because at that time, everybody was meeting with Mussolini, everybody was meeting with Hitler, was writing to Hitler back and forth. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, as we know, some historians tend to, you know, project their view or, or their feelings about Nazism, fascism, and racism, and all of that, from the perspective of the 21st century until the uh, 30s and the 40s. So uh, this is something that uh, mm. I, I, I think it's uh, uh, it, it's bothersome and it's right. not, uh, correct. I, I agree. My point was not that. My point no, was no, no, my just, no. I understand. I agree. My point was that there was cooperation between uh, National Democrats, uh, um, um, UNDO supporters, and um, Convalis and, and OUN in, in certain places at certain times for specific reasons. That's, that's uh, documented. And this was one example. This is very hard. How do you see Polish 
historians now how we see Polish uh, attitude in view of the Volhynia and genocide and so on. Um, I follow Polish press. I have never seen worse publicity, more negative, more everything. Now, when you talk about, let's say, Indonesia, Polonia, uh, anyone who just browses to a, let's say, to think of them and study can see that in 1918 there were 44,000 schools in the language. 1939, there were four. Pacification in between, horrible situations which were raised in 31, 32, even at the convent in the United States. So we cannot say about some kind of you know, equality or whatever you call it without presenting the background yeah, to yeah, the maybe. United States. But this is somehow not addressed. Uh, Poland now, supposedly our friends, has done this terrible movie, has passed the genocide resol uh, resolution, has uh, continuously uh, sort of, I don't even know how to say it, has been negative in portrayal of my dance. Uh, you say about you know, some people sort of, you know, regular Fox, no. Uh, professor at Warsaw and in Wrocław, full-fledged professors were actually commenting, finally the Bandarites are getting their asses kicked about Ivo He was not punished, he is still teaching, full-fledged professor. So how do you see, like, we are supposed to recognize, you know, certain excesses? What about Polish historians, Polish politicians? Right. Well, I don't think you should uh, view all Polish uh, academics uh, the same way, uh, or all Ukrainian academics the same way. There has been a long discussion now. Uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian academics and Polish academics have been meeting for many years now, uh, having joint conferences, writing uh, books together, and there is a developing consensus. There's a, a slowly a developing consensus between, you know, the, the academics. The problem is very often at the at, a, at the level of popular views, uh, journalists, journalists, and so on, um, and that's where that's where the, the the difficulties lie. If you talk to somebody like Grzegorz Motyka, who is the leading scholar on from the Polish side on um, on the Volhynian massacres. There's a lot there that he uh, is quite prepared to admit. There's a lot that Ukrainian scholars agree with. Um, there are other people in the uh, Polish intellectual communities uh, who are part of this discourse where they see eye to eye. And those are the allies. You should also uh, be aware that Poland is one of the strongest allies of Ukraine in terms of uh, uh, supporting it against uh, Russian intervention. Uh, helping it uh, integrate to Europe and so on. So it's a much more complicated picture there. But I should also say that there are many people in the Ukrainian intellectual community who are also quite upset by the way things are being simplified. Um, there are, the Taras Wozniak gave a, a, a talk recently. He's the editor, of, or was the editor of the, a journal, intellectual journal called Yi. And he actually introduced Moteka in view at a talk, and he wrote in his article that all these Ukrainians came out, they had firm views, firm, a firm understanding of what Motika had said in his books, uh, and what Motika stood for without having read any of them, or even looked at them, right? So there is, there's, a, uh, there's resistance to, um, among Ukrainians to a, a simplification and a politicization of this issue. Yuri Vinnachuk has written about how silly some of this symbolism, you know, pro, supposedly pro own symbolism is. Uh, you know, they have now, now they, they celebrate the day of the formation of UPA. Nobody even knows when UPA was formed or, 
even the year is unclear, but they have a date and they're now sort of celebrating this. Uh, Portnikov, Vitaly Portnikov was written about how uh, if we politicize things to this degree, we'll never get any kind of comparative framework. We'll never really get to understand things. So it's not just, it's not Ukrainians and Poles at loggerheads. It's a discussion in which many Ukrainians and Poles see alike, but it can be politicized. And unfortunately, in the last year with these, or this, this year, with these resolutions and the nasty turn that Polish, uh, the Polish government has taken, I think, it, it, you know, they're whipping up some very anti-Ukrainian feelings. But, yeah. Senya, can I just say one short thing? Yes, please. On this topic. I think the criticism that of Poland in this particular case it is an indirect compliment. Let us not forget one thing. Ukraine is an independent state. It exists for 25 years. This is part of being an independent state. To get criticism, to give criticism, to, to have, a, have a, an ideological policy for a certain period of time, for another, th what, what do you expect? Th this is normal, and actually it's, it's showing that Ukraine is being taken seriously. So I wouldn't be worried about such criticism from Poland, from Russia, for anybody else. Just continue to do one's own work, as is being done. Yes. Thank you very much for these last words. As Ukrainian diplomats, I fully support you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was the transition, because oh, yeah. I knew you were next. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, to make this story short, um, such sort of meetings uh, <coughs> take place in Ukraine. <coughs> Unfortunately, they are few or perhaps in control. Uh, where I see the uh, positives and negatives of uh, today's discussion between Ukrainian and Polish uh, representatives, historians, uh, media, etc. Uh, first of all, it's a good lesson for Ukraine and Ukrainians that we have to know our own history to recognize our own sins and, and uh, heroes, etc. For that, we need, we, we would need a state. We didn't, we didn't have it. Poles did, and that is why they, 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 they presented so eloquently and visibly. So, um, the second moment, which is also important. So first, uh, to, to make it happen in Ukraine as well, in different audiences. Second moment, uh, which may be English-speaking people do not do not remember every time. The word nationalism in English and nationalism in Ukrainian are different things. The word nationalism was thought to be a sin in Ukraine. The nationalists were, well, Hitlerites, Nazis. Nationalists and Nazis were equal to Ukrainian or Russian-speaking person in the Soviet Union, and not only in the Soviet Union, in Ukraine first five, ten years by inertia. So we have to be very, very careful in using the word and in explaining the word. Uh, my own best explanation for the word uh, nationalism in Ukraine was nationalism, it's a Patriotism to the key. Nationalism is a patriotism in action. So, and all these discussions should, when I when I when I say about Ukraine, should be brought to Ukraine. Why? Because they should become part of a national understanding where we are, on which stage of the development we are. We cannot go back to the 20s and 30s or to this uh, 1648, uh, etc. And in today's world, the, uh, uh, the values and the, the heroics are quite different of what uh, existed even in the 30s and 40s. Uh, in criticizing what was happening in the, in the 30s and with, with uh, uh, Oun, etc., we have to 
uh, not to forget that all that part of Europe was of the same kind. Hungary, Poland, or, uh, or even part of uh, Czechoslovakia. Well, I don't, I don't say about Italy and, 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 and uh, uh, Germany, and part of France, and, and so on. So, uh, my call is how to, to make it happen in Ukraine in every, in every particular, on every particular level, university level, school level, school level, and uh, 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 politics level as well. Yeah, we need a discourse. Uh, we need to be able to educate people in that discourse. <laughs> but we also have to be aware I sometimes uh, hear the phrase that Ukrainci uh, mifotvorchi narod. They like myth making. Uh, who doesn't? It's what true. People doesn't. It's true. You can't be a people unless you make myths. But but you but you have to be able to separate, s disentangle myths from. Some myths can be very positive, very helpful. Some myths can be harmful. You have to dis disentangle them from Thank some you of the facts. And how myths are made. One thing that I left out of the last too long question was where myths come from. And a lot of literature, politics, and memory assumes always that there's an elite. The elites in somewhere in a few places, it creates myths and it passes them down to people. And obviously, Ukraine is a greatly regionalized country. But at least my experience would tell me on this particular issue that is UPA above all, less all and this sort of, yeah, then people are not really put UPA above all. It wasn't as if you had a tabula rasa in 1991. You had throughout the areas uh, of much of Galicia and Western Ukraine, you had people for whom these were still family experiences. They were, the, the first things that I saw in the Carpathians was people going to find the graves that they always knew were there and to put up the markers. No one from Reveal came to tell them this. You know, they knew where their cousin, their, their, their uncle, their father was very... Uh, where do you stand on this? That is, do you see much of the literature as, as I, would, I would see as too desirous of going from, from some center, myths are now being created? Uh, much of the literature I read tends to then pick out a few people and downplay that there were ideas before that, of course, not, not in areas in Central Eastern Ukraine where they were more affected solely by the Soviets. Well, we could have a whole conference on, on this subject, but this, these people, to, or this is 50 years afterwards, they're, they're going to, to, these, to these graves. A lot can happen in 50 years and that memory can change. Uh, we know, we know. 1990, 80, 80, yeah. 80, 91, right, well, okay, that's... For, now we're 25 years gone. Well, well, that's 45, 40 years uh, later already. Um, and uh, mythologization takes place within families, within e even people themselves change, edit their pasts unconsciously, subconsciously, without fully being aware of things. Um, but there was, uh, you know, the myth making, myth making takes place at different levels. There are uh, there's a, a popular myth making, there is a, a myth making like the writers who conceptualize this in, in, in literary terms. Um, th there's certain kind of myth making is part of literary movements at different times. Uh, the, the basic structures of thought and feeling uh, in, in certain periods is, is, is a kind of myth making in a, in a, in, in a general sense. A, cu a couple of chapters of my book is about the 30s and 40s and the, the myth systems that were developing, not just in Ukraine, but throughout, throughout Europe at that time. Y you can, you know, look at people like D.H. Lawrence, um, you know, writers, uh, you know, Ernest Hemingway, you know, these, these sort of figures uh, were, 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 were representative of a certain mood, a certain style. And uh, in, some, in some ways, these different kinds of myth-making flow together and create uh, a moment. Uh, a moment that can be exploited by pol politicians, can be moved by politicians. I think I'm going to close now to questions. And if you have um, questions,
questions you'd like to bring up in the remaining 10 minutes, you can do so afterwards. And I invite all of those who've been provoked to think and want to engage in research to, to come to the University of Toronto Library, meet with me. We have <laughs> fabulous collections that's true, on yeah, this that's topic. True. Uh, Petro Potichny archive is vast. There's the displaced person archive. Uh, uh, many of these figures. Uh, so, so there is a lot of work to be done. And I would like to thank Dr. Miroslav Skandri for coming here. Thank you for inviting me.